Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, this presentation is actually based on IEEE Internet of Things journal publication that was published uh, earlier this year. And um, before we get into the details, I wanted to start with um, a bit of motivation. So um, as you all know, we have these Internet of Things nodes and they exchange uh, data in this Internet of Things via standardized network protocols. And unfortunately, uh, some of these protocols like OAP or MQTT um, have quite some inherent complexity. And because of this complexity, protocol implementations which implement these protocols um, often contain um, software bugs. And coming back to the Rust discussion uh, we had during this day and during the earlier session, um, some of these bugs, uh, for example, buffer overflows, um, are exploitable. And like most of the network protocol implementations that we have in uh, Riot and also other IoT operating systems are written in C and therefore um, potentially subject to buffer overflows. And this is especially problematic in this IoT operating system domain because many of the mitigations that we have on conventional operating systems like Linux, such as uh, edge space layout randomization, or stack splash protections are not really commonly available on, on Riot and similar operating systems. And um, we want to address this problem somehow, and we're not using Rust, <laughs> but instead we want to automatically test um, the implementation of network protocols in order to find these bugs and thereby ensure that we do not run into these bugs when we deploy our IoT node in, in a production environment where an attacker can potentially send packets to it. And the method we are using for this purpose um, is symbolic execution, which is like an emerging uh, automated software testing technique that has um, been gaining some traction in recent years. And I wanted to uh, start off with a bit of background information on symbolic execution. So the um, basic idea behind symbolic execution is to um, enumerate reachable execution paths uh, through a tester program uh, based on a specific input source. And this is achieved by executing the software not with concrete input values like five, six, seven, or whatnot, um, but instead with uh, symbolic values. And these symbolic values always correspond to or represent a set of possible concrete values at a specific point in time. So for example, all values between five and 10 or all values greater than 10. And uh, these symbolic values or the set of concrete values they refer to um, are um, continuously constrained during software execution to match the constraints that the program enforces upon its input. So for example, if we have a symbolic value A and we take a branch on that value such as A greater five, and from that point onward, A can only refer to values uh, greater than five. And um, the constraints on the current execution path are referred to as path constraints or PC. This is going to be important for the next slide. And um, there are a variety of symbolic execution techniques that have been proposed in prior work. And for this um, publication, we are using a variant of symbolic execution, which is called uh, dynamic symbolic execution, or DSE for mm -hmm. And DSE is essentially a combination of a concrete execution and symbolic execution. So the main idea is that the uh, concrete execution drives the symbolic execution. And during concrete execution, we track symbolic constraints and we collect branches which depend directly or indirectly on symbolic values. And then we can later on reason about branches in the program using an SMT solver. So for example, we can ask the SMT solver to obtain an assignment which triggers a specific branch. And this might sound a little bit abstract. And for this reason, I wanted to illustrate this further using an example. So here we have a very simple uh, C function called uh, myfunc, which takes a single uh, signed integer A as a function parameter, and then it has two branches um, on this 
uh, integer. The first one is if a greater a, then do something. And the second one is if a smaller pi, then do something. And as I said, uh, dynamic symbolic execution um, mixes concrete and symbolic execution. And to start off our concrete execution, we need an initial assignment for this variable a that we want to treat as a symbolic value. And most dynamic symbolic execution techniques uh, use a random value as the initial seed. So for this purpose, let's just assume that our initial value for A is nine. And in this case, we see the concrete execution trace on the left-hand side of the slide. And on the right-hand side, we see the kind of symbolic uh, constraints that are tracked during the execution. And um, so for the assignment A equals nine, we would take the first branch because nine is greater than A. And then the second branch we would not take because nine is not smaller than five. And on the right-hand side, we can see how this affects the symbolic constraints. So initially, um, right here in the root of the tree, A could refer to any value because we have not taken a branch yet, and therefore we don't have any constraints on our symbolic variable A. Uh, then we take the first branch, this one, and because we take the true branch, this means that from that point onward, A can only refer to values which are greater than eight. And then we don't take the second branch, and this again affects our constraints because now A must be greater than eight, and at the same time, it must not be smaller than five because we have not taken the true branch here. And now um, there are parts that we have not discovered um, as we can see with this execution tree. So for example, we have not yet um, taken the false branch of the first if statement. And if we uh, want to come up with an assignment for our variable A so that we take the false branch and we can consult our SMT solver to come up with an assignment for A, uh, which will result in the discovery of this branch. And for this purpose, uh, we take the branch condition here, which is A greater than eight, and negate it because we want to come up with an assignment that satisfies the false branch. And then we ask our SMT solver for a satisfying assignment for the query uh, not A greater eight. And a satisfying assignment for this query would, for example, be A equals eight. And then we perform again concrete execution with this assignment that has been returned by an SMT solver. And in this case, the execution trace will look as follows. We would take the else branch for the first if statement, and then we would again take the um, else branch for the second if statement. Then we can update our symbolic constraints accordingly. So now we have also discovered false, um, false branch for the first if statement. And then again, we have taken um, the false branch for the second uh, if statement once again. And now there are more um, parts of the um, execution tree that we have not discovered, like this one and this one. And we can, again, use the same methodology that we used previously. We can take a branch node and negate it and then ask an SMT solver to come up with an assignment that would result in the discovery of this branch. And if we repeat that until we have attempted to negate all branches, then it would look something like this. So this tells us that we in total have three reachable execution paths through the program. Uh, interestingly, there's also one path that is not reachable. And this is the very left one here because it's not possible for both of these if statements to be true. And that is because there's no number which is greater than A and at the same time smaller than five. So in this case, the SMT solver will tell us that this um, path is not satisfiable because, well, there is no such number. And uh, yeah, this, this is just a very um, basic, uh, easy example, which um, is supposed to illustrate how uh, symbolic execution works. And of course, if you think about realistic code like protocol implementations, and these are not like usually fully explorable uh, within a reasonable time span. Uh, we will get to that in a second. Um, before we do, I wanted to briefly talk about uh, input interfaces in the Internet of Things again, because as I said, the idea behind symbolic execution is to explore all the reachable program paths based on a specific um, input interface. And if we think about the Internet of Things, like from a high level perspective, we have essentially two uh, main interfaces. On the one hand side, we have uh, in the middle of we have our MCU running Riot, and then uh, this microcontroller communicates with a sensor and, for example, receives data from the sensor. And this is basically the interface that we looked at during our last year's uh, Riot summit presentation, where we presented uh, ZimXCP, which is a symbolic execution engine which models sensor peripherals and other hardware peripherals using uh, System C TLM, which is essentially like a modeling language for, for hardware. And then we can inject symbolic values uh, through the interface of these peripherals based on the MMIO interface that they expose. And then we can yeah, explore the software based on potential super inputs. And the other part, um, the other input interface that we want to look at today 
is uh, that after obtaining sensor data, we of course also want to communicate that data with other nodes in our um, uh, wireless sensor network, for example, or with ESN. And for this purpose, uh, we are using um, communication protocols uh, such as co-op or MQTT ESN. And we are regarding these protocols as specifically interested uh, in uh, MQTT ESN. And why are we interested in MQTT ESN? For those of you who are not familiar with MQTT, um, it's a stateful uh, protocol for data exchange in the uh, Internet of Things. And that's interesting because from a testing perspective, that means that we can only test and reach a certain code after establishing a state first. For example, we cannot uh, receive a message for a topic before we have subscribed to this topic. So if we want to test the message received code, we first uh, need to make sure that we have subscribed to a topic, otherwise the code cannot be tested. And um, because of this uh, stateful nature of MQTTSN, there's a really large state space that we need to cover using this uh, dynamic symbolic execution technique that I briefly explained using this uh, MyFuck example. And uh, contrary to this um, MyFunk example, where we were able to like fully explore um, the example function, this is usually not feasible for um, an MQTTSN implementation simply because the state space is so large and it would take very long to fully explore it. And uh, instead, what is commonly done is that symbolic execution is always performed with a certain time budget, like for example, 72 hours or 100 hours or something like that. Usually you will not be able to explore an MQTSN implementation fully within that time span. So the challenge then becomes that we need to um, discover the interesting paths um, in an MQTTSN implementation within that time span. And the interesting paths where, are the ones where we um, assume that most bugs will, will occur, right? And um, usually these are the parts that are really deep down in, in, in the MQTT implementation. And uh, one observation in this regard is that many inputs which could potentially be uh, generated by a small execution engine are uh, uh, rejected uh, relatively early on by uh, an MQTTSN implementation. And this is because they might not constitute valid um, MQTTSN packets. They might be too short, or they might not have the required fields, and then they're rejected very early on by the input processing, and there's a very low chance of any bugs occurring. So what we want to do is we want to reject the amount of inputs that are rejected early on, and we want to increase the amount of inputs that reach deeper parts of the MQTTSN implementation. And uh, to achieve that, um, we use um, a we specify the message format of the MQTTSN protocol, and for this purpose, uh, we are using an uh, embedded domain-specific language or short EBSL, which is um, embedded into the Scheme programming language. For those of you who are not aware of Scheme, it's a, a list-like programming language, and the um, message format specification language that we came up for this purpose can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, this particular example illustrates the uh, message format specification for the MQTTSN subact message, and it is defined in terms of several fields. And these fields can either be concrete, such as the uh, make UN field here, which has a name for length, a size in bits. Uh, this one is eight bits long, and then a value, uh, which is also eight in this case. And apart from concrete fields, we can also have fields that are symbolic. So for example, in this case, uh, we have a symbolic field called flags, uh, with a width of 8 bits, or a symbolic fields called topic ID with a width of 16 bits. And these message format specifications in themselves are nothing new. They are already used a lot in the fuzzing domain. Um, but this is, um, I believe, one of the first um, input format specification languages for the purpose of symbolic execution. And therefore, it also has a nifty feature where you can uh, declare uh, constraints already um, for your field. Uh, this is more of an educational example that constrains the code field to a value between uh, zero and uh, three. Now, um, I mentioned in the beginning that MQTTSN is a stateful protocol, and therefore it's not enough to just have the message format, right? Because the message format that is accepted by the MQTTSN implementation depends on the state that is current that it is currently in. And uh, to also address or overcome this problem, we uh, also need some sort of formal description of the um, protocol state machine. And for this purpose, we are also using a, a scheme-based EDSL, and we advance the protocol state of this formally um, described protocol state machine based on the messages that we received from the MQTTSN implementation. 
and then we can return a new symbolic message format in the format that we have seen on the previous slide, depending on the state that the implementation is currently in. And this is also illustrated on the right hand side of this, the right hand side of the slide. So we have three components. We have the software we're testing, we have our symbolic execution engine, and we have our formal state specification. And the software sends us a concrete packet, for example, a connection MQTT send packet. This packet is forwarded by the symbolic execution engine to our formal state uh, uh, state machine specification. Uh, the state machine specification um, advances its internal state, for example, to switch to a connected state. And then it returns a symbolic message format, for example, a symbolic connect message. And then this is converted by the symbolic execution engine to a symbolic packet, and this packet is sent back to the software, and the software would then be explored based on this uh, symbolic message format. And um, to give you an example of what the state machine specification looks like, um, as I said, we also use um, a scheme-based EDSL for this purpose, and we describe the state machine as a finite state automata with transitions based on the input that we have received from the software, and each transition uh, returns a response format in the um, description that we saw in an earlier slide. So here, for example, we have the definition of the connected state. This receives the uh, message that the client has sent to us as a function parameter. And then we look at the message type. And if the message type is, for example, a subscribe, then we transition. This is the symbol used to indicate state transitions. I transition to a subscribe state in 9.11 and uh, return a response, um, which is initiated based on the subarc format description that we saw on the earlier slide with the symbolic topic ID and symbolic message ID. So yeah, this is what um, our state machine um, specification looks like. Um, additionally, we also have the issue that because MPTT as a stateful protocol, we cannot just reason about a single input. Like with the MyFun example that we had in the very beginning, we just have a single function parameter A. And for MPTTSN, we need to reason about multiple packages because we can have like a connection, then we have a con arc, then we have a subscription to a topic, then we have a message sent to this topic, and then we have a disconnect. So we need to reason about a sequence of symbolic packets or partially symbolic packets. And that, of course, further increases the state space. And to, um, to uh, deal with that, we came up um, with a custom symbolic um, exploration algorithm. And the um, very simplified here, there are details in the paper, but the main idea here is that we always limit the package sequence length um, to a fixed length k. And then we attempt to explore all code that is reachable with this um, package sequence length. So for example, we attempt to explore all code that is reachable with a single packet or with two packets or with three packets. And when the coverage is stagnant, so when we have um, discovered um, the majority of code that has been that can be reached with a single packet, and we um, increment the package sequence length. And the idea here is essentially that we explore the program in its breadth first, and then we iter iteratively increase the depth by increasing the length of the uh, symbolic package sequence. And uh, yeah, this pretty much concludes the uh, description of our prototype implementation and of our testing approach for testing like these stateful network protocol implementations like MQTTSN. Of course, um, we also evaluated um, this uh, this approach, um, and in this regard, we are interested in two research questions. So the first research question concerns itself with uh, coverage. So does our proposed symbolic execution approach, which is aware of the protocol state machine and aware of the protocol message format, does it actually improve coverage? And in order to evaluate that, uh, we conducted experiments um, with the MQTT SN implementations uh, that are provided by Riot, uh, namely EMQt and ASMQt. And for our experiments, we compare our approach um, with an approach that is not aware of the protocol state machine, so does not use our protocol um, state specification language. And um, our approach um, is shown here in red colors, and um, baseline approach is in blue colors. And both approaches uh, were used to execute the uh, ASMQ and AMQ applications for two hours. And on the epsilon axis, we see the uh, instruction coverage in percent. On in the X axis, we see the amount of execution paths that have been discovered. So essentially, we get a mapping here between execution paths and the amount of uh, instruction coverage in each execution path. And um, 
when employing our approach, we can basically see that instruction coverage is roughly 20% higher for both, for both applications, which I think really uh, speaks to the feasibility of, of our approach. Um, additionally, the other research question that we concerned ourselves with um, is, uh, is this approach also uh, applicable to other protocols? Because so far we have mainly focused on uh, MQTTSN. Um, and in order to evaluate that, we um, conducted some preliminary experiments with the uh, DHCP implementations that are provided by Raya, Raya by Riot, and also by Sapphire. And um, for Riot, we tested the uh, DHCP v6 implementation. And for Sapphire, we tested the uh, DHCP v4 implementation. And for Riot's DHCP v6 implementation, we see very similar results with our um, approach achieving uh, better coverage by like roughly 20%. Uh, for Sapphire, the results are a bit different. We see a slight increase, but it's only like 5% or so. And uh, we attribute this to the fact that um, the code in Sapphire's DHCP application, uh, well, the majority of code is uh, reachable with a single input packet, so there's not much to be gained uh, through our approach. But it's still interesting to see that we can also use this to, to test um, network protocol implementations by, by other IoT operating systems, uh, namely uh, Sapphire in this case. Um, additionally, while conducting our um, uh, experiments, uh, we also uh, discovered several bugs in uh, the right network projects that we have tested. So the first bug that we have found is uh, an out of bounds read in the uh, DHCP v6 implementation of the Riot. This uh, has been fixed. And this is one of the issues that might have been less critical if uh, the DHCP v6 module would have been written in uh, Rust. And additionally, we also found uh, a deadlock in um, Riot's uh, ASMQ implementation. Uh, this deadlock was caused by a missing um, mutex unlock on one execution path, and this deadlock could only be triggered when sending multiple packets. So this also speaks to the importance of like, uh, not just reasoning about a single input. And uh, the last bug that we found is probably the most interesting one. Uh, this is a, a null pointer dereference in ASMQ. And this was caused by the fact that uh, Riot's uh, ASMQ implementation when matching uh, request message IDs to response message IDs uh, did not consider the message type. So for example, if you send a connect as a request and then as a response, you receive a sub uh, as a queue would assume that uh, it is a conac, even though it was not, and then it performed all kinds of weird computations, uh, which ultimately uh, lead to this uh, null pointer uh, dereference. And um, yeah, regarding like the error detection, um, we were only able to, to find bugs which uh, trigger Riot's panic handler somehow. And the last bug uh, we only found because of the small quantity reference. And um, otherwise, we would have not been able to, to find it. And this brings me to uh, opportunities for future work, because one thing that would be uh, interesting to, to do um, with these protocol specifications that we have in place now is to encode rules about the protocol, like what message do we expect um, to a certain request into our specifications so that we can also check for functional errors in the, in the implementation of the protocols. And uh, an additional interesting thing for future work would also be to, to assess the protocol specifications somehow, because um, since these are created manually, there's always the issue that you can come up with a too narrow specification. And if your input specification is too narrow, then you might miss bugs in the MPTSN implementation because you constrain yourself uh, too much. So you have to somehow find a trade-off between a too narrow specification and a too, too loose specification, uh, so to say. And yeah, that brings me um, to uh, the, the summary um, of, of um, my presentation. Uh, so I think the key insight here is that um, automated software testing techniques such as symbolic execution can also be employed to test uh, relatively complex network protocol implementations uh, such as um, MQTTSN implementations um, with comparatively little manual effort. So in our case, you need to write the protocol specifications uh, manually. Um, but they can also be reused. So for example, we were able to use the same protocol specification for testing ASMQ and AMQ. And um, our contributions uh, towards uh, the score um, are the um, input specification language for the message format, uh, the specification language for the uh, protocol state machine. And all of this work has been implemented um, in our prototype implementation um, based on uh, ZimXVP, which is the symbolic execution engine for, for RISC-V machine code. 
And all of that is available on GitHub. And if you're interested in like more details, uh, as I said, there is this IEEE Internet of Things publication called Specification Based Symbolic Execution for Stateful Network Protocol Implementations in the Internet of Things. And you can find all the details there, but I would also be very happy to answer any questions if you have some. Okay. Um, I was interested in hearing how you think this can be best integrated on sort of a continuous or ongoing basis, whether the um, through the exploration that your symbolic execution does, whether that's something that can be used to generate things like unit tests or, or things like that, or, or uh, something that could inform you, but you have inadvertently changed the behavior of things like that, or, or how you think that sort of the exploration that is done here can be used over time, either in an automated way or in a Hey, we've noticed that we changed something when we didn't think that we changed something. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, you have the same issue with fuzzing, for example, right? You could also like run fuzzing on every commit you make. And I think that's also definitely something that, that could be considered for a riot release process, right? There are certain tests that are only run for each riot release and running fuzzing or symbolic execution tests every time you make a new riot release would, would certainly be something that could uh, result in the discovery of bugs. Regarding the generation of unit tests, so the cool thing about this dynamic symbolic execution approach is you always get a concrete assignment for all of your symbolic variables, and you can generate a unit test from that essentially. And that's also how I reported every single one of these bugs by essentially saying, hey, if you send this packet to your MPTSN implementation, then it will crash or it will deadlock. Um, so yeah, that's also something you can definitely do. As a, if, yeah, uh, I was interested why you chose the SimXVP, so I'm totally not familiar with uh, symbolic execution, but I've heard of CLI before, and I'm sure there's a lot of different ones, but I was interested if there's a particular reason that you chose that one or, or why emulating the actual risk five hardware is more interesting than just the object code and things like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a development by our own group, by myself, so <laughs> that's uh, one of the reasons why I chose it. But uh, like the comparison to CLI is also very interesting. Um, because there's actually a reason why we chose to execute machine code directly. Um, CLI, I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but CLI operates on an abstraction level by executing uh, LLVMER, the intermediate representation used by the LLVM compiler infrastructure. And if we think about the embedded domain, there are several things that you cannot really cover um, with LLVMER. For example, inline assembly. Um, uh, in the right schedule, we have a lot of risk five instructions that are used for uh, in the right. Code. We have a lot of inline assembly instructions for RISC V, for example, and with LVMEI, you cannot really cover those. And CLI is not capable of executing code using uh, inline assembly instruction. And for this reason, you cannot, for example, execute Riot with, with CLI. And that's why we um, operate directly on the machine code level. Okay. Thank you. Is that uh, something like your SimX uh, solver? Is it something you can run on like consumer hardware, or do you need like does it run on your laptop, or do you need special hardware support to execute it efficiently? No, it, it definitely runs on your laptop. <laughs> but um, as I said, you want to ideally run some more execution over a longer time span, like several hours, several days, maybe. So the two hours in your example are a little low. Yeah, um, it, it's always a trade-off, like how long do you perform your experiments? In this case, uh, of course, you can always do, do more testing over a longer time period. Um, uh, and I think I actually executed these on my laptop because it has a better oh. single core performance. Um, but generally speaking, it makes more sense to run those uh, on a server over like multiple days. Sorry, I'm going to make